India, if I remember rightly, where Stafford handed out the paper and then said something completely different, but it's a brilliant paper. And Designing Freedom was 1974, published, probably 1973, written. Um, and I just thought to myself, well, it's time we look back at these, some of these challenges. So this is me. For those of you who don't know me, what's the bit I'm proud of in all of that? None of it. It's having two grandchildren. It's probably the proudest thing. The books in the middle, Quality, Intelligent Nation, Intelligent Organization, are all rooted in thinking in terms of, of cybernetics. And certainly Intelligent Nation and Organization are, are ways of thinking about how we might use the VSM uh, and that sort of inspired thinking to run our organizations and our countries. The stuff down at the bottom. The reason it's all there, and we'll come back to this again a little later on in the session, is because we need to get our message out to other audiences. And that's what I seek to do with a number of the activities that I'm involved in. And we'll come back to those. And you can see some of the activities at the bottom, some very strange clients that I, that I work with. Anyway, where did it all start? It all started with my background. I used to be a banker in a previous world, and I worked in productivity improvement in what was then Williams and Lynn's Bank. And I would wander around and I would measure things and count things and add them up and divide them and say they need more bodies here and that sort of, sort of stuff. And what I realized as I did this work over a period of, sort of seven or eight years in the bank was what we had as an organization was what I called a perpetually failing problem solving engine. And on the diagram on the right, at time one, you identify a problem. And you think, oh, I've got a solution to that proposal, P1. And then P1 morphs into model two, because by the time you've gone into a big organization, discovered a problem, defined a problem, done the analysis, added everything up, divided everything, talked to all the senior managers, and got agreement to do something, bloody problems changed. So the problem has moved on. So we're forever running months behind the nature of the problem we had as an organization. And even though I was young and callow, relatively, I thought, well, there's got to be a better way of running an organization. How might we run an organization in something like real time? Now, for the philosophers amongst you, we're not going to get into the debate about the nature of real time, because we haven't got enough real time this afternoon to do that. And on the 21st of April, 1987, at 1759, well, 1659, I discovered cybernetics through a chap called Bob Flood, that some of you will have heard of Bob Flood, uh, or Robert Louis. Um, who came up to me in Victoria Coach Station and said, where did you get your chips? <laughs> so my entire history in cybernetics is to do with a bag of chips, because it turned out Bob and I used to commute together, didn't know each other. And I know it was the 21st of April, 1987, because it's when my second son was born. So yeah, they are, it's all, it's all fits together. So we'll blame this on English eating habits. <laughs> but of course, you now look at it and say, oh, Kondrati F wave, 50 years to mature a technology ish long wave economic theory well if we go back to vena we're talking 1946 47 48 back into the earlier or you're into the 1930s surely the organized knowledge of cybernetics where's uh stephen that spoke just before lunch yeah organized knowledge yeah cybernetics ought to be mature by now and yet i sat here this morning listening intently and thinking mm, um there's work to be done okay Starting in, so 1959, cybernetics and management was the earliest thing that I remember reading year after I was born. So that shows how mature the technology ought to be. In 1973, in Chile, taking the idea of the VSM and cybernetics at the level of the state as opposed to the individual organization. And what that work did, setting aside various things, is it highlighted the potential for the exploitation of technology to deliver more, let's call it more effective, more efficient organizations. But it also highlighted the fragility of democracy. And that's a really interesting sort of counterpoint in that particular piece of work. And we're, we're, you know, it's great to be with Raoul and talk to him about, sorry, Raoul, the old days. First time I understood anything that Stafford was saying was I heard him speak at an event in London and I'd read his books and I'm sort of, uh, I better go and listen to this bloke. And it was only in listening to him that I started to understand what I thought he meant. And whether he actually meant it or not is what I thought he meant. And his best writing for me is in Designing Freedom. And that series of radio lectures for Canadian Broadcasting, um, in which for me, what he articulated was this philosophical principles for thinking about the world. Forget the VSM, forget the technology stuff. It was about 
the humanity of the man. And when I look at the critique of VSM cybernetics over the last however many years, that's the bit that everybody damn well misses. What an amazing human being he was and his care and love for his fellow man that, yes, it came through in all sorts of models and stuff. Could have been in all sorts of different ways. But actually, it was all about improving the human condition. And we kind of miss that when we get lost in the technology. And here, the real threat to all we hold most dear. This is recognition of the threat that emerges from technology. And back to Stephen again. Um, I think it was Vina, uh, but it might have been Ashby, can't quite remember, um, was cybernetics is not about things, but about ways of behaving. And that links us back to that idea of humanity. So the real threat to all we hold most dear Buckminster Fuller, if government ever gets his act together, then we are all in real trouble. And those of us who are UK taxpayers at the moment are in deep doo-doos, aren't we? Um, because government is finally getting its act together. The most efficient government system is the one for collecting tax. Works Sadly, it works really well. Mm -hmm. But actually, it works both ways in really well. And then in 1993, World in Torment, we explored this notion of chronic societal triage. The ways in which the dynamic organization of the world tends to centralize and concentrate resources in ever smaller numbers of hands. And I kind of work that through in a number of ways. And we take Pareto, and we think, oh, so 20% of the people have 80% of the wealth. That's Alfredo Pareto whenever it was, 1500-ish, 1485 or something. But of course, 20% of the 20% have 80% of the 80%. Uh, so 4% of the people have 64% of the... Yeah, of the wealth. And hang on, so 20%, that's 0.8 of the population, have 80% of the 64, which is somewhere around 50. Somewhere around, not a mathematician, never was. If we look at where we are today, still in torment, that simple bit of arithmetic says, well, what have we got? We've got contemporary society, political, economic, and planetary challenges, war, starvation, and climate change. <laughs> Pick the order, it doesn't really matter because they're all interlocking wicked problems. We've got poverty, we've got inequality, we've got discrimination. We've got centralized or centralizing government power. And it was Anthony Sampson in 1987 in the Anatomy of Britain wrote about how power was centralizing in the UK. And that was, what, 10 years into our venture with our friends in Europe. And it hasn't got any better, I think it'd be polite to say. But as soon as I said this morning, John, you said 80% of the environment agency budget has gone in the last however many years. On top of that, we've got international oligopolies. Both the governmental oligopolies around things like the UN, the World Trade Federation, all sorts of interesting stuff like that, that controls and limits what we're able to do as individuals, as corporations, and as nations. The EU, specifically, Treaty of Rome 1951, I can't remember what the clause number is, specifically talks about competencies and the ways in which competencies, legal competence to do things in the Treaty of Rome are inherently embedded in more and more centralisation. Everything drifts towards Brussels. Now, we can argue about whether that's a good or bad thing, but the fact is there, it's in the Treaty of Rome. If we'd read it before we joined in 1973, would we have thought differently? This week... Elon Musk, back to the, the point eight of the whatever it was, is tipped to become the world's first trillionaire in the next three or four years. So please stop buying his cars and his other things. And, his, uh... <laughs> and we have what by any standards is infinite computing power coupled to centralizing systems. So my laptop sitting over there switched off. It's probably not switched off at all, really. I just think it's switched off because the lights have gone out. Um, it takes a snapshot of the screen every few seconds for a system called Recall that Microsoft have introduced and not told us about, which they then store. So regardless of your web browsers, your security settings and all the rest of it, Microsoft are just taking a picture of your screen every few seconds. They know everything you've done. They may not know it's you. Not easily, anyway. That's happening all the time. Back to your cybersecurity threat that you mentioned earlier. So Windows, Android, Apple, consolidating the ways in which we can engage with each other globally into two or three key systems, all of which are incredibly vulnerable to penetration by naughty people. 
what that does is exploit those challenges named at the top to consolidate the power in the hands of a few people globally. And in a, you know, in a population of whatever it is, eight and a half, nine billion people, the hands of a few is probably quite a lot of people, but it's still terrifyingly small compared to the population as a whole. Cheerful, isn't it? Glad you came. So I think since 1993, not a lot has got a lot better. Partly for me, that's about our dominant model of organization, the bureaucratic model, which I've described as flailing and failing. It thrashes around, gathering stuff to itself. It assumes that there is a definable problem and a definable solution to the problem, and that that solution and problem will sustain. Well, of course, that's nonsense. But the solution always involves more bureaucracy. Just another procedure, just another process, just another audit, just another check, which requires just another person or just another set of systems to do. So our inefficiency becomes further and further embedded in the way we run our organization, in the delusory pursuit of the answer. Triage pumps resources to the highly organized low energy system. Flat batteries get charged by full batteries. Mm. System is perverted to serve its own ends rather than ours. Logical autopoiesis and delusions of efficiency are pursued at the expense of effectiveness. So cleaning the water in the river valley, yeah, what is it we're trying to achieve when we do that? If we're trying to drinkable water, the preservation of the water system, the efficiency that the water company will be pursuing is a cheaper way of maintaining their pumps and valves. So they have a delusory efficiency, but if our system is not effective, it cannot be efficient. Okay? If it doesn't fulfill its purpose, and we'll talk about purpose briefly in a minute, it can't be efficient. Bureaucracy, I like this one. I just covered this word the other day. I thought I'll use that on, on, on Wednesday. And it was abnegation by individuals. We hand over our power and authority and accountability to the system and deny our responsibility for it. And I suspect most of us who've worked in large scale organizations have seen that and maybe even been part of it. And of course, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. So, yeah. Keep an eye on the, the last government was pretty crap. The new one's turning out not to be so great either um, because they're behaving in exactly the same set of ways, slightly different beneficiaries. If we lose clarity of purpose for ourselves and we have to take responsibility and we lose clarity of purpose for the organization, what is it for? Then we are, to a very large extent, lost. Technology is exploited to capture, suppress, control, and manipulate. Scary, but true. And freedom is designed out, not designed in to the way that systems are put together. Because you look at it and it says, if you want to do this, then you must give us the password. If you want to use your Android phone, you've got to put a credit card on it. You've got to prov prove your identity. Now, I'm old enough to remember the brick phones. People used to ring me up just to talk to me on a phone that wasn't wired in. Are you in the car? Oh, great. <laughs> Let's talk had a nine number memory and you couldn't send texts. That's a um, proper phone. Freedom is lost, democracy, for all of its flaws and it has plenty with us. Uh, for those of you who are European, Greece 2011 decided it wanted to run a particular budget, the European Union decided it shouldn't and imposed a technocracy on Greece for a number of years. In Brexit Britain 2016, whether misguided or not, and I claim that I have an Irish and an English passport or British passport, so I'm ambivalent. Um, the British people, rightly or wrongly, said we'd not like to be part of that club anymore. And the British Parliament set out to obstruct the execution of that decision. Yeah, for about four years, five years. Now, whether that was the right thing or wrong thing, I'm not going to debate. The fact is, that's what they set out to do. And France this year? Anybody familiar with French politics this week? They had an election about a month, six weeks ago, in which basically the votes went a third, a third, a third. And the President Macron has decided that you know, you're the Conservative, I'm going to put you in charge. 
And of course, the other two thirds of parliament, not so impressed. The biggest party is yours, a bunch of socialists. That's fine. But he doesn't want socialists in charge, so he's putting the conservatives. Where is the will of the people in a process that's like that? Where is our democracy? Where is our power in a system where our leaders abnegate their responsibility to the system? Cool here, isn't it? <laughs> Why does some of this stuff happen? And it happened to me. Um, the weaknesses in our education system, biggest single weakness for me, back again, comment earlier, is about our philosophical education, our ways of thinking about the world, our ways of being in that world. And Stephen, you mentioned values, and values have come up at various points of, of the day. It's our ability to reason about our position, our ability to think and argue for the things that we believe are important. And when you look at professional education, we do the same damn thing there. People are tested on what they can regurgitate, not on what they can think. And we're protected from it. So the ultimate result of shielding men from the effects of folly and women, this is 200 years old, is to fill the world with fools. If we want to change the way things are, we need to get people to think and elaborate and explore, because what we end up with is the thought police. We're seeing that. We've been seeing it for the last couple of years, certainly in this country. For those of you familiar with Brave New World, we've read about Soma. You know, East Enders is Soma, Coronation Street is Soma. These are things that are designed, as is most of social media, to appease the base appetites of humanity. Porn's the same damn thing. It just stops us realizing how damn miserable we all are in the system that they've created for us, in which we have limited agency. Uh, I've turned my phone off and I've turned my laptop off, so hopefully Big Brother is not listening at the moment, but um, when this goes out on Zoom, no doubt it will be. Okay. You are <laughs> But actually, when we listen, and I can't remember who it was who used the listen word this morning, when we listen to what the people of the world are telling us, what we hear is we want viability. We're thinking about our sustainability. Um, Kate Rayworth, donut, I can't even say it, donut economics, um, all the sustainability, triple bottom line stuff, environmentalism, yeah, Gaia hypothesis for those of you who remember James Lovelock. That is all about people saying, actually, there is a different way of doing this, which might be more sustainable for everybody, economically as well as environmentally. But we can't solve a problem with the same thinking. You've got to quote Einstein, haven't you? Even if it's a corruption. We can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. Yet that's what we seek to do. We appear to have more bureaucracy. Well, yeah, one more decision will help. One more step in centralization will make everything better. I used to, John up there used to be an auditor. Um, I used to be a banker. They used to argue with auditors all the time. So I would design a process with no audits in it at all, knowing that if I put one in, they'd make it two. If I put two in, they'd make it four. So I put none in, so they're going to add one. Mm -hmm. the bureaucracy just grows. And when we can't decide between two competing things, we appoint both of them. And we build another bit of there. You can remember Northcote Parkinson, Parkinson's Law. Now work expands to fill the time available. I think the way we think about ourselves and our organizations. Bit of a big moment for realization for me was, oh, it's not just of an alternative hierarchy. It's an informational hierarchy which is emergent. From the interactions, we talked about interaction earlier, the interactions of the people are what create viability. And we go backwards to codify a structure in which we can capture those interactions. So we don't work from the VSM to the interactions, we work from the interactions to the VSM. It works the other way around. It's viable because we make it viable, because we engage with each other in a semi-structured way, which helps us to have the conversation, the interactions that generate viability. And at some point, we draw a diagram that says it looks a bit like this. Yeah, I commonly do it with salt pots and tomato ketchup. Um, and that viability is about adaptation. And somebody was sort of dissing Darwin's, uh, you know, what was the word? Evolution earlier. Yeah, well, sort of kind of evolution sort of kind of works, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Um, but only kind of works. And our adaptation has to be Deliberate. We have to anticipate. We have to look at the clock and say, okay, it's nearly half past two. I've got about five, ten minutes left. 
um, we have to prepare and we have to prevent the things that are going to hurt us. And our viability rests in our ability to do that, not in our ability necessarily to respond to bad things that have already happened. But we also have to be able to respond and create. And that system is behavioral, it's processual, and it's informational. And it's synthesized into a single picture. It is not we do behaviors today and we do information tomorrow, we do process the day after. We have to do all three things simultaneously, commonly holding in our heads multiple models of the world as we see it at the same time and reconciling their differences. In this diagram, what you might see is that structurally, there is a solid background. The gray boxes say there is a structure, there is a form that an organization must have. But actually, people, you can see two heads facing in different directions, are at the heart of the enterprise. Two heads are sitting in the middle of a heart with the picture behind them. Okay? And the key questions that are being asked in the middle are what and how, and most importantly, why? Why is ultimately the only question that matters. Because if we can agree on the why, the what and the how will resolve themselves. If we don't tackle the why, the what and the how can never be, can never be satisfied. So that's the cover of my book. The painting was done by a lady called Annabelle Elford um, for me, based on a very bad diagram that I drew on the whiteboard in my office. Um, and I think it's quite beautiful because it expresses that synthesis of ideas you know, in a way that the technocratic DSM diagram tends to lose. Because I'm really passionate about it's the behavior that matters. If we behave in ways that are viable, we'll create a system that is viable. Okay. Now, for me, I translate that into the way I do my world of work. And my adaptation says, on my right-hand side, you know, a cycle of reflection. Over here, I'm thinking about the world, and I'm thinking about new methods, new ways of working. On the left-hand side, I'm testing those ways of working in real life and feeding the results of that set of activities back into my practice. So I'm trying to create an evolutionary process for myself that says, I don't keep on making the same mistakes, I make new mistakes. Hmm. Rather than the old ones, I can leave the old mistakes to other people. Okay, so if we're gonna succeed and survive, we need a means of solving challenges that reach at the rate of their arrival. We have to solve problems at least as fast as they arrive. Stuff had talked about this in Designing Freedom, the rate of perturbation of the system. And actually, we operate in a system now that never quite settles. So we have to be able to anticipate what the next perturbation will be and respond to it before it happens. Those of you who drive a lot, like I do, will do this when you are driving. You anticipate the behavior changes in the traffic pattern around you, and you resolve your direction and journey to fit in with those of others. So we can do this stuff in real time. We're quite clever as people. We don't solve problems. We manage the mess. Thank you, Russ Acoff. The problem goes away in some way, shape, but it comes back in a different form. So we're just moving it on. Cybernetics argues for clarity of purpose. Back to the why. Why are we doing this stuff? It argues for distributed control. And one of the fears that I see with... Uh, when, my first question I was asked on my PhD, Viva, was, was um, Fenton Rob sat there and said, so, John, this, um, this VSM thing... This is a bloke who got his PhD and awarded by Gordon Pass, by the way. Um, this VSM thing you're wittering on about in this, in, this, in this thesis, it's just a really complicated form of bureaucracy, isn't it? It's a great opening question. I have no idea what I said, but obviously I survived. Um, if we lock ourselves into the diagram, the alternative hierarchy, the alternative structure, we lock ourselves into the least important bit of the VSM. But for me, that distributed control allows problems to be solved as near to the source as possible. That deals with the problem of latency. And uh, whose tortoises was it? Um, Gray Walters with tortoises, where you know, the local controller and the central controller and the latency in communication, you can induce psychosis in a robot, it's good fun, um, by giving it two alternative targets and, and then imposing latency in the communication. So I'm guessing going left and I'm going right, the thing goes mad. So we have to be able to resolve latency. We can only resolve latency by making decisions close to the source of the problem, very simply. Yeah, back to the perpetually failing problem solving engine. By the time it's gone up to the board and come all the way back down again, half the, half the population's died, the other half's moved on. 
So the assembly and distribution of information is the key to our viability, because our behaviours are informed by information. Our decisions are informed, and our decisions inform backwards down. So we create this through our understanding of the way we use information. Here's an alternative way to think about some of this. This is Pete Dudley's work. Pete Dudley did his PhD roughly at the same time as me. I think I finished about seven years before him because he was a bit of a slow learner. But um, what Pete said was 345, the meta system of the VSM, is actually about managing today, system three, creating tomorrow, system four, and nurturing identity, nurturing purpose, system five. And actually, far from being three separate sets of activities, they're an integrated conversation where any of us working inside an organization is kind of saying, well, if I do this now, then that prepares me for tomorrow. And why, well, I'm doing it because I'm Catholic or I'm doing it because I care about humanity or doing it because I like the dog. It doesn't really matter. We have a why. It helps us to fulfill. So we can actually then set off the tension between the short-term expediency of we need to fix this problem now because we're polluting the river and the longer-term policy decision that says we need to change government policy. And we need to be able to do that within the same conversation and recognise the legitimacy of the conversation with each of the constituents that falls out of that. And we need to be able to hold it all in our heads at the same time, which can be quite difficult at times. Systems thinking, and I realise this is heresy for those of you who are pure cyber efficient and don't think systems thinking is legitimate. Within the canon of systems thinking methodologies, there are a whole bunch of stuff that helps us to do some of that. One of which down here, yes, integration, total systems intervention for anybody from Hull, VSM twice. All these tools help us to think about the dimensions of that problem and help us to solve them. I should stand near the door when I say this bit. I'll, stash, I'll stand behind the lectern because it's a bit safer that way, but my head down. Um, Cyberneticians have a tendency, A, to talk amongst themselves, B, to use language in a way which, intentionally or not, excludes others. The arcane and obscure terminology that we, should, we start to talk about first, second, and third order cybernetics. Now, that might or might not mean something, but it doesn't mean anything to the, to the accountant or the engineer. So actually, what we have to do is think about what is it we're committing? And why do we do it? Sometimes I think, well, we don't really believe it ourselves. If I make it difficult, you won't ask me too many awkward questions. Sometimes we're just not very good. We need to talk about things in the language of the people that own the problems. That's very rarely us. It's other people. We're helping them with what we perceive to be their problem. If we can't translate, if we can't get our message across the boundary into their world, what the hell use are we? There's a particular one there. There's been a bit of it this morning. There is a political impact in terms of the redistribution of power from doing cybernetics. Well, for the argument I presented just now about latency, yeah, if we're going to nail latency, we have to make decisions more locally. If we're going to make decisions more locally, we're taking power away from the centre. So if we do the science properly, the political problem solves itself. We still need to educate people. Well, I realized as a young banker that the further I went up the organizational hierarchy, the less my power to subvert the organization was. The junior analyst, nobody really knows what you're up to. Classroom teacher, nobody really knows what you're up to. Head teacher, you're visible to the auditors. Yeah? So what you can get away with varies according to your place in the hierarchy. But the science, well applied, will deliver the social outcomes that most of us, I think, are kind of looking for. Our clients aren't interested in the whys and the hows very often. They don't care about the purity of cybernetic thought. They care about the bottom line, rightly or wrongly. They care about the performance of the business. We were talking there, you know, at lunchtime uh, about um, the optimal performance of the team. Well, that might or might not be important, but performance is something we actually then need to have that conversation about. What does performance mean in this context? How do we interpret it? How do we deal with it? How do we capture it and measure it? Are complex conversations. And we tend to be frightened by complex conversations. 
employability, empowerment, customer satisfaction, cost control, they are all things that come out of thinking about the purpose of the organization. And then there's this. Are you familiar with Machiavelli? Must be considered there is nothing more difficult to carry out, nor more doubtful of success, nor more dangerous to handle than to initiate a new order of things. There's a whole bunch more in the prints, but that's sort of kind of favorite, favorite quote. Because that's actually what we're talking about, is how do we change the world? And most of the world doesn't know it wants to be changed yet. It will. <laughs> okay. So this is me. Just I thought it'd be worth sharing some, some stuff with you. Having said all that stuff about be brave and go and embrace the world, this is how I embrace my world. So I've been a treasury advisor, which is a most peculiar position, um, where they invite you in and then tell you why they think you're wrong. Um, but nonetheless, you can talk to them about infrastructure investment. So work I did in 2009, 10, led to the creation of the Infra Infrastructure Projects Authority and the National um, Infrastructure Authority because we looked at the way in which, as a nation, we dealt with the challenge of emerging infrastructure, decided it was done really, really badly, and there had to be a better way. Now, we ended up with institutions, which is always a bit of a problem, but nonetheless, there's now something going on. I did the first systemic mapping of the national infrastructure in 2008 for Gordon Brown. Went into a report by the Council on Science and Technology called A Network of Networks. It was an infrastructure for future Britain. Now, these things are influential. Um, this is another that is not a dodgy rock band, although I kind of sometimes wish it was. It's an organization, a religious organization of 300 and mainly elderly, mainly Irish nuns who run 37 care homes, three schools, a bunch of AIDS clinics in South Africa, and a whole bunch of other stuff who were failing as an organization. And myself and, a, and, a, and another cybernetician, he is now forced into a PhD, um, helped them through a global transformation that took them from a short term very high likelihood of failure to a thriving organization which has started to grow again. And the VSM was the organizing framework that informed the whole of a piece of work over 10 years in seven nations. Huge. Network Rail, John's working with me at Network Rail at the moment. We're looking at modeling the effect of weather on train performance. That's all about the ways in which the organization uses information about weather, about its assets and about its network in order to try and optimize its position. Um, working with medics to change the way they do diagnosis because their medics are really bad at diagnosis. It's not obviously falling off or bleeding. They don't really know what to do. So working with them to help you, know, what does a better diagnostic process look like is quite interesting. Pharmaceuticals, again, using information to understand performance chemicals and, and how they affect the body, it's quite fun. Mushroom farming was good because that was all about this is a long time ago when we were still using Lotus 1, 2, 3, for those of you who are old enough to remember Lotus 1, 2, before Symphony. Uh, when you make compost and you seed it with mycelium and case it in peat, that determines the number of mushrooms you're gonna get in 42 days time, give or take a day. So how, in a market that's doing this, do you decide how much, how much compost to make, how many mushrooms to seed? Because once you've made that growing decision, you can move it plus or minus a day, but you're kind of stuck with what you've made. They're a low margin, high volume product. If you make too many, grow too many, there's no market for them, you lose a load of money. So again, using information to think about the patterns of behavior, and this is in the mid nineties, the patterns of behavior in the marketplace. A very rudimentary computing, it's a, a 386 state of the art computer. Working with SAP, one of the biggest providers of, of commercial software in the world. Um, when they ran out of ways to do things, they came and talked to the cyberneticians and said, how do we solve this problem? Good. Okay. So what have I learned in 37 years of doing this? Speak in the language of the listener. Translate your well, thoughts and ideas into language that those other people can engage with. Because if you talk in your language, you just put them off. Learn to translate the key concepts and ideas in cybernetics and systems thinking into language that they can accommodate. So re-express your ideas in terms of accountancy or engineering or whatever. Um, and then give it what the marine engineers call the float test. Lob it in the water, see if it floats. If it floats, carry on. If it flies, stick with it. If it doesn't, keep having the conversation until you find a language that works. I learned this from my father. He had a series of strokes just before he died. Um, with people with Alzheimer's, with dementia, 
you kind of have to work with them where they are, not where you are. And it's a really powerful lesson to bring back into what we do in the world of work is to understand that their position for them is entirely rational. So why wouldn't you be in their world? Last conversation I had with my dad, proper conversation, was he was in 1942 inside the gun barrel of a ship in Devonport Dockyard, um, explaining to me, because I was wearing a blue jerkin, uh, what, what he'd done to fix the gun before the ship went back into the battle later that evening. It was a completely rational conversation, but I had to be where dad was. Very weird. Um, Find people in authority, willing to listen, and be challenged. There's remarkably few of them, but they are out there. Find effort to find the people who will listen. You know, it takes time, but you eventually get there. And if you don't, you stand back and watch the organisation eventually collapse, so that's okay. Be clear on what they're trying to do. Be clear on what you're trying to do, and work out how you close the gap. Be brave. Yeah? It requires courage, it requires persistence. It requires, I call it their forthright. On my website, I said, John Beckford is an unreasonable man, as a Nick from uh, Bertrand Russell and George Bernard Shaw. Um, you actually have to be unreasonable at times with this stuff. Be prepared to be ignored. The serenity prayer for the alcoholics amongst you, or the fag addicts, or the weed addicts, or whatever else happens to be. Um, we have to make progress, and we make progress incrementally. We're unlikely ever to revolutionize the world in a big batch, but we might revolutionize lots of little bits of it in sequence, okay? Which means we have to do this stuff to recognize when the battle we're winning, you know, we're fighting, we ain't gonna win. So let's step away and go fight somewhere else for now and come back to it later when we have a bit more energy. And that's me. Thank you very much for listening. Tea break or 14 minutes of questions? Raoul, of course. Oh, Raoul asked me a question in 1994 at the OR conference in Hull. He said to me, so what's your philosophical position on that? Pragmatism. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Raoul, go on. No, the, I thought uh, John's talk was very, very meaningful and very significant. As in many of the previous talks, I the impression that we can talk a lot about things, but perhaps we don't say too much about how to make things happen. And that's a distinction I make all the time between the informational domain and the operational domain. So in the informational domain, we can say many things. In the operational domain, we need to understand that things can from the people, they produce the differences and they are the ones who change the world. So, and that connects to one of the topics of this Congress, as uh, it was proposed by Igor earlier. Relationships, relations, interactions. Can you spend a few seconds about these three things? so that we make the connection between the informational and the operational domain. Um, the word is how, um, I suppose, in that sense. So, so um, I'm probably a slightly odd creature, a bit like Steve Brewis over there. I'm happiest in my office at home staring at the wall thinking. Now, I'm at my most content, and the world's leaving me alone, and, it, and, and it's kind of fine. But if I want to make the sort of difference to the world that I think I'm trying to make, I have to go out and have that conversation. So I have to find people to interact with, to explore with, to test whether what I'm thinking is acts of utter madness, or whether there's some resonance in it for them that helps them to think about how they change their organization. And I have to hold their hand, metaphorically mainly, in working out a how. So if this is the change we want to make, what are the sequence of things we need to do in order to deliver it in the organization? So it's then about thinking about the implementation process that goes from, that's a good idea, we'd like to be over there, what's the sequence of steps? And I learned something from Angus on this a couple of years ago, he'll be possibly surprised to, Angus said, don't climb over the wall, take the bricks out of it and walk through, or words to that effect. So thank you, <laughs> Angus. Really, really powerful insight for me, that actually, there's a better way of changing this, we'll just move the wall. Fantastic. So how do we help our client to move the wall? And then they end up in the right place. The process of physics will take them to the right place if we move the barriers out of the way. Identify the barriers, get them shifted. Really good, Angus. 
Okay. Thanks. The only point I would add to that is that uh, we need to, to have the capacity to produce change from within so that it's not only that we tell people how to do things but, or that we have the capacity to help people to see things, but is how is it that people actually do things? <laughs> so, so there are three doctoral students at Loughborough at the moment um, studying different bits of the, of the railway project that we're working on, one to do with AI, one to do with cultural change, which John's going to talk about later, um, and, and one to do with... Um, Knowability, the unknowability of data in a relatively large organization. All I can do as a PhD supervisor, as somebody who said, actually, I think I can create an opportunity here, is I can find people who are brave enough to take the step over the wall for themselves. Then I can help them to work out what to do having got to the other side of the wall. But they have to take the first step. I guess it's a bit like Alcoholics Anonymous, isn't it? You know, or gambling. First of all, you have to admit you've got a gambling problem or a drinking problem. Yeah, that's step one. So, yeah, 30 years of organizational life, in, in some cases, and they're scratching their heads and say, why doesn't it work? So somebody like me or you comes on and says, well, I don't think it works because of this. And, oh, that's interesting. Can I get a bit closer? And then you get reel them in, you know, a little bit at a time. You pull them into a space where they go, hmm. Actually, I might want to do something about that. Well, if you're going to do something about it, I was talking to Max, Max yes, earlier in the day. It's all very well working with Mr. Brewis, you know. But actually, at some point, you have to formalise the knowledge in some way, shape or form. Might be a doctorate, might be a master's degree, might be a book, might be a brilliant, mind-blowing business. doesn't really matter. But you formalise and articulate the knowledge through a set of actions in the world. The scary thing, and I say this as a father of two boys, um, boys, 14, 37, and two grandchildren, three and a half and a month. Well, the month, month old is, is not too much of a worry just at the moment. But with children, all you can do is help them understand the world for themselves and then send back and see what they do with it. And clients will say, we cannot control what people do with the knowledge we give them or share with them. We have to Share it in the best way we can. We have to understand the values that we're sharing that knowledge with and hope that they will go and do something nice with it, not something bad with it, but we have to let them get on with it. We can't control them. If we try to control them, we end up in the bureaucratic problem that we started with an hour ago. Louis? Since, since I'm always asking for the microphone, I should uh, use one. Uh, thank you so very much. What very, very much intrigued me was uh, where you started off with recognising Stefan Beer's humanity in be as a person when we look at systems and cybernetics it has always been a promise of wholeness and agency so my question to you is how does humanity inform and form our sense of agency in this wow. or to go to the famous Turner question What's love got to do with it? <laughs> we have to. I was, I was brought up as a Catholic, which is interesting. Um, Irish Catholic, which is really interesting. Um, because however far away you might get from the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church is always there, sort of hanging on to one to one shoulder, and it's forming you with a set of values about the way you 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 do stuff. I don't know how you, I don't really know what the answer to the question is. I think, what do I want to do? I want to give you the best information I can and stand back and allow you to make your own choices. I want to pick you up when you fall, if that's an appropriate way to, to put it. I want to help you when you're lost. Now, whether that's a Catholic thing or a cybernetic thing, it's a learning thing. It's about, so, you know, my granddaughter is three and a half. She hasn't learned to walk. She's learned to not fall over, which is very, very different. Yeah, defining learning in the negative. I'm not going to do that again, Papi. It hurt. Good. The learning's happened, so she's moved on. But the responsibility for the learning, the responsibility for creating the conditions sits with me and her parents, mainly her parents. The responsibility for the learning sits with her. So we have to, in our human sense, allow other people the same humanity that we have and want for ourselves. And I think, 
I'm happy to have a debate for several hours over this one. I th that's a good way for me of dealing with it. David, do you need a do you need a widget machine? Thanks very much, John. Uh, I dislike dishing out praise, but occasionally people make it <laughs> difficult not to. Uh, however, <laughs> um, do your best. <laughs> obviously, if uh, we follow the prescriptions which you gave us in the second half of your talk, which answered virtually all the questions I had in the first half of your talk, we're going to make a massive difference in the world if we can actually remember what you said 24... You can have copies of the slides later. <laughs> okay, 24 hours later. Uh, the I, I like the bit about getting through to people in power who are interested in change. Nevertheless, a lot of people in power are insecure they want to maximise their status, their information nodes, their power, even money for what it's worth. And that tendency is going to continue. And I'm curious about how far you can get without not necessarily attacking, but perhaps subverting um, that set of perceptions. I mean, you, there is always a market opportunity for honesty and integrity. I'm not quite sure how large um, it is, and I'm not sure how long the, you know, the, we, we whether loop, this will remain. We loop back, David, to Raoul's question, mm. because actually you know, my ability to influence the organisations I work with, the people that I work with in them, is rooted in relationships with those individuals. It's not the science in that sense. It's yeah. rooted in the ability to have a conversation with somebody. And it's what my goody at GNER used to call, um, we used to call them the war memorial conversations. So we'd wander out of GNER, main headquarters in New York, go for a walk around the war memorial, which is about a quarter of a mile, and talk about stuff that couldn't be talked about in the office. We could ring each other up at the end of the day. And I, I mean, I, I seriously pissed him off once over a conversation I had with a union leader. Um, and he rang me up, we had a row. A really, really big row was to be in the middle of King's Cross Concourse about what I'd done, why I'd done it. Now, I knew the downside consequence for me as an independent consultant was he won't write me another check. Money not that important. So you have to be in a position, what Rod Eddington called, you have to have fuck off money. You have to be in a position where they can't hurt you particularly financially, so it doesn't matter. Um, the following morning, I get a phone call from him. What time are you in New York today? Let's have coffee. What he respected, if you like, was that what he heard as the integrity and the conversation that I had had and the position I'd adopted, regardless of the consequence for the commercial relationship. And uh, Christopher Garner, who was the chief executive of GNER at the time, um, we went to those terribly formal dinners, black tie, penguin suits, all that sort of stuff, um, uh, at the Royal United Services Institute. And... Uh, Christopher was sat there, I was sat there, and various other people from organisation was looking at said, Christopher, why do you keep John around? Because he's the only person that always tells me what he's really thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah, and this is a guy running a £600 million a year turnover business with yeah. 5,000 staff, you know, living in a big house in Putney, and all that sort of stuff. Most people will not speak truth to power. Yeah. Our power mm -hmm. is the ability to go and do that, mm -hmm and to be able to articulate the science that gives it justification. Doesn't make it right, gives it justification. Yeah. And they can either listen to that or not. That's their responsibility, not ours. Yeah, so some of those dudes will surprise you. Thanks for the airtime. Not at all, thank you. Now I think um, it's precisely one minute to three, which should mean that it's the end. Is there one more, are you happy? Angus, quick one. Sorry, you better have the talking stick, haven't you? Um, thank you, John. I think that's the best thing I've ever heard from you. <laughs> and I've heard a lot of good things from you. So there's something um, I can't ask. I, I don't know that I can ask the question really clearly, but it's an invitation. I think there's something really important that's still trying to get out from you. What is it you'd like to really, really tell us to close off? <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> Oh, what do I really think? <laughs> wow, that's a really good question, Angus. Um, I think the answer is going to be very blunt, so, so do forgive it. 
It, we need to get off our asses, stop talking to each other and go outside and talk to other people. And we need to keep doing that in a way which tries to engage them. So, um, And I realised I wasn't having the impact on the world I wanted to have. And it was because I wasn't going and talking to anybody. <laughs> I got happy in my little world. So getting out of my office, going and doing things like this, reading, writing, conferences, attending events, the more we, whether we ultimately agree with each other on some of this stuff or not, doesn't matter, the more we evangelize for the idea of thinking about a cybernetic approach to the world, the more the world will come to us because people will listen and hear, they will see the benefits of what we're describing you know, and all that sort of commercial stuff I put at the end. You know, we reduced the dwell time in the University College London Hospital ED from over four hours to under two hours by thinking about the way we use information in the hospital. That's massive. No, don't talk about it enough, do we? Again, we don't talk about that. But that's the, and you have to be this sort of bloody minded unreasonableness um, from all of us to change the way the world thinks and works. Tomorrow morning, I've been invited to talk to the Department of, oh, I didn't even know it existed, Energy Security and Net Zero. I've no idea how they found me. Phone call Monday? Yeah, Monday, saying, yeah, would I be willing to talk to them if, would I, um, what I think they're interested in is understanding the energy performance of buildings in a different way, informed by a cybernetic approach rooted in the use of information, not just to measure the energy use in the house, but to help the householder and the energy companies and everybody else actually understand uh, how they can use that information to improve energy performance. If I can get that gig, I have no idea yet whether I will or not, that's hugely powerful because it gives me access into a whole network of governmental relationships. Uh, but you only get there by being visible. You only get there by being out there communicating the ideas and, quite frankly, being ignored a lot. I've spent a lot of years being ignored. Um, it's not very comfortable, but hey, you know, I've been thrown out of more good places than this, I tell you. Um, but you know, the good people get it. So evangelize, Angus, I think is the, the short one word answer.